So the first thing I want to talk to you guys about tonight is um, a, a fable from, from days of yore. Um, it's actually about a guy like me. In fact, it's, it's about me. Um, way back in the day, and, and so I've got um, a little bit of a problem, and uh, I'll admit it. And it's unfortunately not a small problem. It's a, it's a really big problem. Um, I really like Super Mario Brothers. And um, like really like it. Really, really like it. And um, so many years ago when the Nintendo DS was announced, I was really, really excited that the new Super Mario Brothers was coming out of it. It was a 2D platform, which I think the best Super Marios all are. And uh, I was super stoked, except it was around Christmas time, uh, sometime in the early 2000s. And I, back then, I didn't have a whole lot of disposable income. And it seemed like a really big investment to me to go and get a Nintendo DS and, to, and get the game. And I was a little bit worried about it, because I knew I had played a lot of Super Mario Brothers in my past, and I was worried it might consume me. But right after Christmas, a little bit of cash saved up. I'd gotten some, some gifts from some very generous people. And I decided, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go get this thing, and it's going to be awesome. So at the time, I was living in a place called Prince Edward Island, way out here on the, the east coast of Canada. Yeah. There's a lot of Canadians yeah, here. half the crowd from yeah, Prince Edward Island. My people. <laughs> um, and so I, I went off, and I drove up to this place called the Future Shop, which is our version of Best Buy in Canada. And this is the future shop that I went to at a photo I found on the internet of that future shop at about the same time of year. Um, it is no less welcoming today than it was back then. Um, I went in there and I laid down my hard-earned cash to buy um, the, the Nintendo DS and, and get the, the new Mario game. And it was awesome. It was everything I had hoped it would be. It was so cool. You could not just become like big Mario, but like crazy big Mario that like destroyed all the blocks. And it was super cool. And so I played it, and um, I played it a lot. And I beat uh, all the levels, and then I beat all the levels and the secret levels, and then I beat all the levels and the secret levels with all the coins. And then, you, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the Nintendo DS, but you could save three slots. And so I did it again even faster, and then I did it all over again even faster than that. And so after the end of three months, I played it just about every single day, um, and pretty for many hours. And I realized. I was just about to reset the device so I could do it three more times. And I realized I needed to put a stop to this. And I said, screw it. I stuck it in a box, mailed it to my sister in Los Angeles, and I've never seen that damn thing again. <laughs> um, but there's a lesson to be learned here. I you know, was out 170 bucks in three months of my life. Yeah, and uh, to, to throw into sort of sharp relief what, what an idiot Daniel is, which, which, I, which I love to do, I'm going to tell you guys a story of my own. Uh, this is a story from a simpler time. And um, actually, quick show of hands. If you remember when Nintendo was new and looked like this, raise your hand. OK, good. OK, I'm glad to see that some of you are also old. Um, so, uh, so this story takes place in the year 1986. And it's actually a story about my wife. My wife was nine years old in, uh, in 1986, as was I, but I didn't know her at the time. And, um, and, uh, and, and she, like every other nine-year-old American, uh, I don't know what was going on in Canada, wanted a Nintendo more than anything. And this is what a Nintendo looked like back then, for those of you who didn't raise your hand. Um, big, bulky you know, device. And, um, and they were fantastically expensive, so $199 in 1986 is a, a lot of money and you know if you're nine years old at any time this is a lot but in 1986 to to let you guys know in 2013 dollars i mean it's over 400 dollars it's a lot of money um and actually for you canadians i'm not sure about the conversion but i maybe that will help so um i get this crap all the time you grew, up in a, you grew up in an island you had to get to on a float plane Are you, really <laughs> Just so you guys know, the craftsmanship that went into this, I, I researched that. That's how many liters you can get for 400 bucks. <laughs> and you'll notice I, I spelled liters the Canadian way. So just so you guys know the, the care that went into this slide. But anyway, my wife is very industrious, nine years old. She does chores around the neighborhood, she scrimps and saves her allowance, and she saves up enough money to buy a Nintendo. And she's just about ready to plunk down her hard-earned cash. And right at the last minute, she gets cold feet. Like, oh, God, this is a really 
big purchase. You know, I'm nine years old. I, I don't know if she thought that, but you know. So she she made an arrangement that for four dollars she'd rent a Nintendo from her neighbor, and so all weekend long she'd have a Nintendo, all the games, and she could play as much as she wanted and see what it was like to own one. So this is the scene that I think my wife imagined uh, it would be, you know, be like to have a Nintendo. And um, it, this is a, this is a like, promotional, promotional material from Nintendo from that era. And um, if you guys look closely at this family, they are tremendously excited to be uh, playing Nintendo. In fact, the brothers are so excited they don't seem to notice that Super Mario Brothers is actually a one-player game. But, um, <laughs> But, but, but this is like, you know, in the 80s, the Nintendo was new, and this is like how you felt. You're just, ah, you know, and, and, um, and this is what she imagined, that her family would all be in on it, but the reality was more like this. And uh, this, is, this, is not, this is not an actual photo of, of my wife. I found this on, online, but I think this is, this is what, what it was like. You know, she's sort of eyes bloodshot up until 3, 4 a.m., you know, playing Nintendo, and by the end of Sunday night, she took it back and gave it to her neighbor, and she was like, I cannot handle owning a Nintendo. And so for $4 and, and just 48 hours of her time, she learned what Daniel did. Uh, this idea of renting before you buy has a lot to do, I think, with um, prototyping and software development, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So Jake and I have worked in a bunch of startups and a bunch of companies, and now at Google Ventures, um, as a design team, we work with the portfolio companies that Google Ventures has invested in, which is just over 200 companies now. So we've got a lot of experience working with some really great product teams. And the way great product teams frequently develop products um, is they'll come up with, and you, you might recognize this, this process, this is the kind of ship early, ship often kind of process. You come up with an idea, you know, your hypothesis that you want to test. You Engineer as quickly as you can, so you're building a, a minimum viable product. You, you know, let everything go that, that isn't absolutely necessary. Keep it really simple and lean. Then you launch it, get it out in the wild, get it into real users' hands, and then you measure the results. We've discovered that this really actually isn't a very good way to build software. Um, at least it's a, it's a suboptimal way to build software. And um, we've been working on a process that, that shortcuts this. Because the problem with this process is you frequently start with um, a bad idea. I mean, by definition, you're testing a hypothesis. And by definition, hypotheses, hypotheses? You're close. It's I mean, it's good, good. <laughs> In Canada, we add extra vowels. Yeah. Um, you, they're frequently wrong. And so you could be engineering, actually, a, an idea that's no good. Um, even if it's a good idea, now you spend a whole bunch of time building it. And unless you guys are much better at doing projections than I am, you frequently spend a lot more time doing this than you anticipate. Um, and now that you've invested the time engineering it, you kind of look back and you're like, oh, well, it's good enough. I guess we'll just launch it. And you put it out in the wild, spend a bunch of time you know, communicating to users that you're going to launch it, and the lovely data that you're hoping to, to get back after launch is often a lot messier and a lot more open to interpretation than, than you'd like to think. And now that you've got it out in the wild, you got this feature that may not actually work that well, and even if it's not the best feature, a few of your users are going to think it's the greatest shit ever, and so it's really hard to roll it back without um, going through a lot of political trouble with your, your user base. And instead of iterating, you often just move on to the next shiny idea and just leave that old one kind of festering uh, you know, in the pile of code that you now have. So what we do instead with a lot of our portfolio companies is a process um, over a week that really shortcuts this. And what we're doing is we're going all the way from ideating, my clicker is working pretty poorly. Um, over the course of a week, we go from ideating to sketching to prototyping to testing. And inside of a week, we can uh, validate whether or not I, our hypotheses were correct. And we call this a five-day design sprint. And we've done this now with over 70 of our portfolio companies. So I'm going to tell you a story about one of these sprints. And um, the, the company that I'm going to talk about is Blue Bottle Coffee. So um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Blue Bottle Coffee. It's a, it's a coffee company that we invested in. It's not a clever name for a, a software company. Um, and, uh, and they have a, a number of cafes in San Francisco and New York City. And um, in fact, if you go to uh, the Ferry Building just nearby here, um, you know, there's a, a, a you know, for those of you who are from San Francisco, there's a bunch of shops inside for commuters and tourists. And there's one in particular that always has this long line kind of stretching out into the, to the hallway. And 
it's not the store that sells only mushrooms. It's um, it's uh, <laughs> some of you guys know uh, the fungi store. So um, so it's Blue Bottle Coffee. They're really known for these uh, these these long lines, and um, uh, and there's a reason why there's a long line. And in fact, in fact, if you look closely at that at that line, you may notice a familiar <laughs> sort of gangly praying mantis style figure, and that, that is that is in fact me waiting. A praying in line. mantis with only one shirt, apparently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, so, so it can be hard to find shirts in my size, but I mean, find one. You like to stick with it. So, uh, so there, you know, there I am, like eagerly getting my coffee. And I can tell you, if you haven't been to Blue Bottle, it's, it's really fantastic coffee, and they have this wonderful in-store experience. Beautiful interior design, and wonderful, friendly baristas, knowledgeable, and great coffees, world class. Um, but Blue Bottle also had a, a website, or still has a, a website, and on the web store there, you can order coffee beans, and they'll ship the beans to you, freshly roasted. And um, Blue Bottle wasn't happy with the, the performance of this web store. So we would made an investment in them. They came to us and said, could you help us uh, redesign the web store? And so we did one of these sprints with them. One of the first things that we want to do in a sprint, I think one of the reasons why people like to ship early and ship often is it, it gives you a deadline. If you're shipping, then you've got to have things done so you can ship them. And um, I, I tend to be a natural procrastinator myself, and I'm sure you guys aren't. Maybe one or two of you also are procrastinate from time to time. And I find a deadline really helpful. So we manufacture one at the outset of our sprint. What we'll do is, if we're doing a five-day sprint, we'll start off by setting up a deadline on Friday that we can't get out of. We'll recruit five users usually, um, just using Craigslist. We'll find customers who look like the, the company's customers, and we'll bring them in for, for five separate interviews. And once we've set that deadline, once we know those people are coming in on Friday and we haven't even started doing anything yet, we're like, holy crap, like we gotta get something done. You know, we're, we're very focused. Um, and it can be every bit as, as tense and uh, in, a, in a positive way as a deadline to launch with marketing lined up. Another thing that we found is really important is having the right people in the room during the duration of the sprint, you know, with their laptops closed. And uh, what happens is there's more right people to have in the room than we generally think when, when we're doing projects. So in the example of Blue Bottle, we have folks who you'd expect, like engineers and designers and product people, the people who are going to be actually building the website, and it makes sense to have them in the room. But we think it's also really valuable to have a, a broader array of people from the company. So in this case, we've got James, the founder. We've got uh, the CFO, people who really know how the business works and, and why it works that way, as well as people like customer support and uh, marketing who are on the ground and know about how the, the cafe works and uh, all of the things that, that make it a great in-store experience. So it's good that we've got all of these potential insights because this, this problem is actually pretty hard. Blue Bottle's got, you know, if you go in there, there's 15 different kinds of coffee and 15 brown paper bags that look more or less the same, except they've got a different name on them. And if you have to decide which coffee you want, and you've never had their coffee before, it's going to be tough. You've got to prove to you that it's good and, and, and help you make that decision. And I don't know how to do that. So one of the first things that we, we did, um, not maybe very surprising, is to look at how other companies do this who are successful. And if you look at coffee sites, you go into coffee stores, you'll see this pattern where the coffee is organized by the region that it comes from. So you can see here, Latin America, Africa, Indonesia, and here it is again, and here it is again. You'll see this over and over. And it's not just these small boutique coffee shops that do this. Here's a menu at Starbucks. Um, they you know, know a thing or two about marketing. And you can see Guatemalan, Colombian, Ethiopian coffee. Actually, quick show of hands, if you know the difference between Guatemalan and Colombian coffee, raise your hand. Oh, okay. We one. one person. Okay, okay, one person. Okay, so, and, which is awesome. I mean, I don't need to, like, to call you out. That's totally awesome, but the, I just want the rest of you to know that you should not feel bad. It's, it's yeah. no, nothing to be ashamed of. To we we even had a, a guy at, in the user studies at the end of the week when we showed him one of these sites, and uh, he had actually admitted that he, he roasted his own beans at home, so he was buying uh, raw green beans and then roasting them, and he, like, was so sheepish, he was like, Guys, I really think I should probably know this, but like, depends how I roast them, you know? They taste so different at the end. So even he felt stymied by it. And we were like, dude, like, don't feel bad. If you don't know, nobody knows. Like, we're not roasting our own beans here. Um, so, you know, not to make you feel bad, but normal people don't understand what, what this means. And, um, and so well, once we kind of like tapped into that, we were, we're like, well, you know, we asked James, the founder of Blue Bottle, what do you think we should do? Because 
James really wanted to bring the cafe experience to the website. And so we said, how do you handle this in the cafes? And he said, well, you know, um, we train the baristas that if somebody comes into the cafe and they're you know, looking at those 14 brown paper bags, and there they are, and they're trying to make a decision. When they ask for a suggestion, we'll train the baristas, and that's an actual barista, it's not me wearing a hat, to train them to, to ask the person, how do you make your coffee at home? Because if you make your coffee with a French press or a Chemex or drip, it's going to help the barista tell you like, the kind of beans that, that you're going to enjoy. And I remember that like, right when he said, how do you make coffee at home, I kind of like looked over at Daniel. And Daniel's <laughs> eyes got, got big, and it's like this beam of inspiration like, <laughs> shone in from outside the window. Just, just like that. It's just like that. It's, it's a photograph. So you know, it's really literally what happened. And, um, but that insight about organizing the beans by the way you brew at home is something that we never would have gotten if we hadn't had all of those people from the company in the room when, when we were working on the project. So we've gone through some research and we've choose some challenges that we, we think, you know, uh, like choosing between those, those 15 brown bags of coffee that uh, we want to test. And so the next thing we do is we go through an ideation process to try to figure out how we might actually solve those problems. So we actually get everybody to be drawing and we spend quite a bit of time at this. We actually spend um, most of one day sketching ideas. And uh, what this person is drawing here is actually uh, like a little version of an interface for tackling a problem. And we usually get people to sketch um, several panes, so they're actually not sketching like a screen, but they're sketching an interaction of how a, a user might actually um, go through a process. And we don't do any group brainstorming. Um, we actually very explicitly avoid this. Um, it really leads to group think and uh, leads people kind of off base a lot of the time and lets uh, kind of the loudest person in the room frequently get, get the um, other people to rally behind them. Um, so we have everybody uh, sitting around the room, all sketching on their own. Um, and I mean everybody, not just the designers who might be able to draw prettier stick figures than everyone else. This is James, the founder. So everyone here is sketching a whole myriad of possible solutions to, to the problem. And in the end, we've got a whole bunch of ways that we might actually test something. And it's, it's great to have like 10, 12, 14 different, you know, well thought through designs. Um, but obviously that's too many. We, we can't prototype 12 different designs. So we have to decide. And uh, another little trick that we use is to vote rather than having a big discussion. I'm sure that some of you have experienced what I've experienced, which is sort of marathon meetings where you're like duking it out and trying to decide academically what's the best design, what's the best way to solve this. Um, and uh, we, we really don't want this, this to happen. So our little trick is uh, something called weighted voting. So the idea is that everybody in the room gets as many of these little blue stickers as they want. And they can take these blue stickers and put them, you know, all the papers are up, all the drawings are up around the room. And they'll put the stickers on portions of ideas that, that they think work well, that they think show promise and, and they'd like to see us explore or at least you know, consider. So by the end of that process, everybody going through like that, you've got kind of like a heat map. You know, you guys have seen heat maps of, on the web. So you'll, you'll basically see these like clusters of blue dots around things that, that are interesting that people are finding compelling. And we'll talk about those quickly. We'll move you know, around the room fast and talk about those different spots. And then we, we weight the voting. So um, in this case, we want just one or two. In this case, it's, it's uh, James, the founder, uh, people to make the decisions about what we're going to prototype. So James gets six of these red dots. They're big and red. They're going like, to drown out the blue ones. And he'll go around and put them just on the parts that he wants to make sure that we prototype. And then we'll try to figure out how to make that work. So by the end of that process, we've gotten you know, some very opinionated James's take on what's the best uh, way to go after he's heard all of our arguments. And we've got this, um, this idea of recreating the cafe. So taking that beautiful interior design of the cafes and actually trying to like literally translate that onto a web page. Another idea is to tell the story of Blue Bottle. So there's all this knowledge and expertise that the Blue Bottle team has. It like comes through when you talk to them. And what if we actually like went text heavy and tried to like just put that right on the web? And then the last idea, that one that made Daniel's eyes light up with glee, is, uh, is this idea of sorting the coffee beans by um, the way that you brew coffee at home. Nobody else does that, so we're not sure if that works, but James is pretty compelled by, by trying that out. But there's like these three different ideas, so now we have to pick which one we're going to prototype. 
And what we decide to do, and what we often do, is to not decide. We, we're actually going to do like a battle royale and prototype all three of them and pit them head to head and see which one does best because we don't know the answer in that, sitting in that room. And however, it is now Thursday morning and we've got only one day left to do this prototype. So, so what are we going to do? Yeah, so this might seem a little bit crazy that we've spent um, three days out of five uh, doing research and ideation and now we've left ourselves with you know, we don't work until four in the morning to get this done, so we've got you know, eight or nine hours to really pull together three fairly significant prototypes. But we've got some tricks that help us move really quickly here. So you may not think there's enough time, but what we have is a whole bunch of ideas sketched out in fairly good fidelity. So when we were doing those sketching exercises earlier in the week, um, we don't let people kind of hand wave like, oh, people will click somewhere and then this other thing might happen. They're, they're very specific in terms of suggesting how an interaction might work. So we can actually go back to our, our little pieces of paper and there's real copy on here. There's real suggestions about where you know, the photography might go and where the buttons might go. So we're able to lift those ideas and take them straight into the prototypes. And as I was showing on the previous slide, we're doing, even though we've only got one day, we're doing actually fairly complex interactions. So we're stitching together you know, 10 or 15 screens to build a full, fairly immersive prototype for the users coming in the next day. And the way we commonly do this is we use something like Keynote. We're trying to build prototypes at what I call like a Goldilocks level of fidelity. It's neither too basic, so we're not doing paper prototyping, we're not using something like balsamic. Um, we're also not focusing on the very high fidelity. We're not sweating whether or not the buttons are just the right shade or the corner radii or exact. Um, but we want it to be just at the right fidelity where users who come in on Friday will have, can suspend disbelief. We don't want them to think that they're looking at a bunch of mock-ups necessarily. We want them thinking they're looking at real, a real web app here. And with Keynote, we're able to do this fairly quickly and also to involve non-designers in the prototyping process because it's not um, like teaching Photoshop in a single day to some people. Um, we also have a few tools that we use. So we use um, something like Keynotopia a lot of the time. If you guys aren't familiar with this, it's totally worth, a, what, 100 bucks or something. Yeah. It comes with a whole bunch of default form elements and, and just general widgets. And you can drag them into your Keynote files. Um, particularly for prototyping, is immens immensely useful. And so in the end, we've gone from having these three basic concepts that we want to test to three fairly sophisticated web apps um, fully sketched out. Um, we even create fake brands in the case of a project similar to Blue Bottle because we don't want people who are already familiar with the brand to be, to be somehow swayed into liking or disliking things. Um, so in this case, we've created Telescope Coffee, which is uh, the storytelling mock. Um, this is the, the skeuomorphic, you know, recreate the cafe idea. Uh, called Linden Alley and Potting Shed, which is testing the, the coffee filtering mechanism. I'll try. So, um, so now it's Friday morning. People are going to come in, strangers who we do not know are going to come in and look at these prototypes that we made just a few hours before. It's an extremely tense time. Um, but I want to talk for a second before I reveal to you what happened in the test. I want to tell you about um, just about research because I think a lot of small companies, we talk to a lot of small companies, and um, a lot of times they don't want to do research or haven't done research because there's a perception that it's really complicated. Like, oh, you know, we need like a behavioral psychologist to conduct the interviews, and we need like a, a special room with a one-way mirror and a, you know, like an eye tracker. Yeah, and, laser eye tracker. Yeah. Like, you can't do testing without lasers. Without a laser, we have to have a laser eye tracker, we can't start. And, um, and so the, the way that we set these up is very unsophisticated. Um, not that Daniel and I aren't sophisticated, but, but the method is unsophisticated. So we basically got like a laptop which has a webcam built in and, um, and we're running Keynote full screen and it looks like you're, you're in a browser looking at a, at a real web page. Um, using Apple TV or GoToMeeting will project what's on the screen and the webcam video of, of the, the participant over to another room where the rest of the team can watch. But in that room, there's just one of us doing the interview and then one of these folks at a time who we've brought in, you know, we've posted this ad on Craigslist and asked people to come in and then filter down on, on the right folks. So we do five of these interviews. We're showing each person all three of the prototypes and mostly just watching and asking them questions as they go through and 
kind of observing what happens. So what ends up happening at the end of the day is that we get, we get data without launching. And Daniel talked about the problems when you launch something into the wild. You may have a large number of data points, but you don't always know why something works or doesn't work. When you do this kind of study, you don't get as many data points, but you really do know why. You can hear people talking about it. You can watch their faces react. You know why some things work and some things don't. It's quite powerful. What we find out in our battle royale is that this, um, this idea of recreating the cafe doesn't work at all. People really do not, uh, do not like that. But that's good. So we were excited about that idea ahead of time, you know, I'll admit. Um, but we were able to find out that it sucked without having to launch and, and go through all that painful process Daniel described earlier. As for the others, it turns out, counterintuitively, that a lot of text actually works. People might not read all the text, but it lends credibility to the uh, telescope coffee concept. And how do you brew at home also works. People find that's a very intuitive way to, to pick beans. So those kind of risky ideas that James had, each of those was a bit counterintuitive, turned out to, to pay off, which is great. Um, and now that they've got kind of some confidence, so they, having seen people react to these designs, they, they felt like they could go all the way around and, and, and build the design for real. So here's the, the design post sprint. You can see at the top, it's got this filtering thing. How do you brew your coffee at home? If you go to bluebottle.com, this is how it works. And, um, and you can see there's, there's actually a lot of text in here. In fact, like when you see a block of text like this, I think I mean, this kind of goes against everything I think is true about the internet. This doesn't look like something that I, I you know, want to put in design, but it turns out this helps people a lot. They care about the story of the coffee. And um, having that confidence, Blue Bottle went ahead and like, designed it and built it. As you saw, they launched it. And now they have those large number of data point real world metrics. And the new design is doing quite well. So it's been out for a couple of months and they've, they've doubled their sales growth and they've doubled the time spent on site, which is totally great. But at the same time, that's, that's just a website, right? Right. So I can imagine you might be sitting there and being kind of skeptical that this is like a one size fits all process. And first of all, it's not really a one size fits all process. We use many of these elements every time we do a sprint, but we uh, tailor the sprint frequently, how we do the prototyping, um, even how we do the ideation stuff, depending on the specific challenges that, that are coming to us. And we've had a lot of success with a lot of companies across a lot of different fields and doing things that are significantly more complex than, a, than an e-commerce site like you saw with Blue Bottle. Um, We've done work on iOS and Android, a lot of mobile work with companies like Pocket. We've worked with um, a mobile fitness startup called Fitstar uh, quite a bit um, with a lot of success. And Blue Bottle's customers are, are kind of everybody, you know, anybody who's um, kind of in the upper echelon of the, the coffee business. Um, and, but we've frequently worked with, with much more difficult um, to recruit uh, users for studies. Uh, we've worked with everybody from investors, so Circlup's a company that uh, lets investors connect with uh, businesses to do fairly significant size investments, so kind of minimum $10,000, $20,000 investments. Uh, a company that works with woodworkers a lot. Geneticists, which is a very interesting challenge. Farmers, this company uh, called the Climate Corp. Even with doctors, this is a project we did with a company called Foundation Medicine. Um, so we're working with uh, oncologists on, on, uh, on a report uh, about uh, cancer. And we've even worked with startup founders. Uh, we recently redesigned our own website. We launched it maybe about two weeks ago. And when we were working on it uh, earlier this year, we actually went through a sprint process ourselves and came up with a bunch of hypotheses about how, kind of what are the important things for investors when they're considering um, raising money from any of, of a myriad of, of venture capital companies. And we found a bunch of um, users, a bunch of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, founders, and had them come in and, um, and tested a bunch of, of comps with them and learned a lot about what's important to, uh, to those founders. We even use this process in kind of crazy ways. Um, we're I'm currently in charge of redesigning a build, our building in Mountain View, California, um, with a significant budget. Um, and before we got started, we kind of laid out our basic ground rules, and then we were uh, engaged an architect to work with us. And I don't know if you guys are, you know, have ever done corporate architecture before, but you frequently get presented with images kind of like this one. Um, 
they're really hand wavy. The architects will talk to you about, you know, oh yeah, people will just gather in the stairwell and they'll have all these, you know, impromptu conversations and <laughs> idea sharing across your organization. It's total BS. They have no idea if that's how people do it. And most architects build buildings and then never watch how people actually use them. So you get these things, there's like friendly ghosts walking around your office. <laughs> there are uh, file cabinets at jaunty angles. I don't know how many of you have clean desks like this, but it's total bullshit. Your, your office will never look like this. Um, and one of the things that came up when we were talking about the redesign was um, how entrepreneurs would, would use this space. And one of the suppositions we had early on was that there was this meeting space just outside of the main conference room. And it was totally a dead zone. No one ever used it. Um, and there were two theories on this. One was either it was a shitty place to sit with an uncomfortable couch and a weird video meeting screen that people can appear on and talk to you, like staring at you if you sit on the couch. Um, so it was a pretty good theory, I think, that you know, it, it was a shitty space and so no one used it. And then the other theory was that as part of the ritual of coming into a, a VC, people don't really linger outside meeting rooms and there really aren't casual conversations like that. So we really quickly um, picked up this furniture and threw it in a storage room somewhere else on Google and we put it in kind of more casual um, environment and actually we're putting um, like coffee and drinks and stuff intentionally out on these things to encourage people to gather there. Um, apparently we didn't get rid of the robot screen thing, but maybe he was the problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but by prototyping this we actually discovered, you know, I actually kind of sat nearby here and watched a bit, no one used it, like nobody ever used it. And so you'll notice that our new, um, oh, so the assumption that spontaneous gathering happened was a false one. And you'll notice that our new, uh, the, these are the floor plans from the, the new building. Um, we were able to reclaim quite a bit of hall space to have a significantly larger meeting room. Um, and we, there is no such thing as a, a hangout space, a spontaneous <laughs> gathering space outside of our, our meeting room. So we got like pretty excited about this process ourselves and, um, you know, like a, person with a hammer, we kind of see everything through this lens. Um, and, uh, and I want to leave you guys with sort of three of what I think are the, the key elements that we found make it work again and again. Um, the, the first one is that notion of creating kind of a crazy external deadline that you can't get out of. Um, it's amazing what you can accomplish in a week if you only have a week and you're forced to only have a week. Uh, the second is to build things that you are okay with throwing away, things that are just good enough to appear to be real, but that aren't actually real. And that's an important distinction. And, and then lastly, to do research with people who are outside of your team, your company, people who will be seeing these things with fresh eyes and reacting to them as, as if they're seeing them for the first time. The statement that you see up here, we, you know, we hear this a lot, we say this a lot, but kind of interested in the idea of like editing this statement. Because what everybody really wants to do is to learn early and learn often. And when you phrase it in that way, you open up the possibility of renting before you buy and learning so that you can ship with, with confidence and know what you're getting into before you go to all that expense of <laughs> the big, long circle. And um, that's all we have. You want yeah. to talk about the... Yeah, and so... We obviously haven't had a, a ton of time to go through in incredible detail about how um, we actually conduct these design sprints, but we've written about it um, at length. And if you go to this link, there's a series of five articles that explain how each day of a design sprint works. And it's been really kind of neat over the last year or so, we've heard from maybe a dozen companies, um, some fairly large ones, that have taken the idea of design sprints and started using them in-house who we've never even heard of before. We just run into them at, at conferences and um, events like this one. Yeah. And uh, it's really neat that I think the, the guide that's been written here is, is in enough fidelity to really do it on your own. Yeah, so check it out. Thanks a lot, Thanks you guys. Thanks so much it. for having us. I think we've got time for some questions. Yeah. Yeah. I come up with like 95% of the bad ideas, personally. <laughs> uh, so that they, no, I, um, no, actually, so everybody sketches. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, we're sketching right alongside the, the, everybody from the team, everybody who's in the room. Um. So he's asking, so I got asked earlier to repeat people's questions so online people can hear. Um, so he's asking, um, 
uh, how do we get non-designers to, be, to act, be active sketching participants as part of the sprint process? And I think a big part of it has to do with setting the right level of sketching fidelity. Um, so we're really clear at the beginning that this isn't an art contest and that we're much more interested in words than we are, you know, words and, and shapes and arrows than we are in specifically how it looks. And I think this goes both for the designers as it does for everyone else. You c even if a designer is capable of, of drawing you know, beautiful pictures, I would encourage them not to do it in the sprint. I think it's really easy for us as designers. You know, we, great power comes great responsibility. I think we can be um, very convincing by making pretty things and shit, wave our hands really fast. And I think if we focus on the things that are really important, actually, you know, the activities that our users are going to do, you know, the behaviors our users are going to do, um, we'll realize that painting, I don't know, putting a, a picture of coffee up there that looks exactly like coffee beans is kind of not the point. And uh, just writing the word coffee with a big X that means photograph works pretty good too. I think that helps a lot to put people at ease. I think it also helps to set the expectation that you're going to put these all up on the wall afterwards and we're all going to look at them. And, um, Doesn't that scare people? Yeah, I think it scares them. In a, personally, I think it scares them in a good way. But, um, uh, but I think it makes people take it a bit more seriously. And if you give them yeah. enough time, and we'll give people you know, 30 minutes, an hour, more than that, yeah. to do the sketches, it, um, when you emphasize text, it levels, it levels out, but, yeah. but forces people to I've be serious. I've even seen, you know, to, to what I was saying a second ago, I've seen Jake, so he he's kind of is the, the ringmaster for a bunch of these sprints. I've seen you actually draw on the whiteboard, you're like, okay, for the next, you know, X hours, we're going to do, you know, um, you know uh, uh, concept sketching. And a concept sketch looks something like this, and you sketch one out, and then they realize that you're not Picasso, and so maybe you're not so intimidating. <laughs> yeah. We, we also, I don't mean to, like, answer this question for 20 minutes, but, uh, but I love this stuff. So the, we, we want to make sure that people don't start with, like, a blank canvas problem, where they're just like, oh, my gosh, I have to draw a UI, and I just this blank paper. So we start, and we, we have them... Um, take notes on things that are around the room. So they've got 15 minutes to just like look around and write stuff. They don't even have to think. They just write down things that they think are interesting. And then we have the mind map. And we say, okay, just mind mapping for 15 minutes and just quietly on your own. And, and then you're doing like a, we do a quick sketching exercise. And, and then after doing all that, then we do like the actual sketch. Yeah. I think that helps too. People have a lot of stuff to draw from. And we're, we're even using like fairly low fidelity markers. So it's a fairly yeah. fat tip marker when you're working. And uh, that means like your fancy pants designers aren't, can't shade shit in, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, like. We, we do talk about what will be successful, what effectively like what metrics they'll measure after the thing launches. And, um, and you know, for something like this, it's, it's pretty s simple. It's, it's things like sales growth and, and, and time on site. But I think a lot of the, uh, we're looking less at task completion kinds of things, uh, which I think is often a, a metric for usability studies, and we're more looking for like what happens. We'll, all of us who are working on it, you know, we'll be in the room watching this live when when the when the studies happen. I mean, not literally in with the person, right? We'll be in the other room, and 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 you just know when you take notes and you say like what went well and what didn't go well, and you know we we track all this stuff after each person we write it all down. By the end of the day, you see these patterns. This thing, again and again, this didn't work. <laughs> you know, and it, I know that sounds like very wishy-washy, but I think the reality is that a lot of it just becomes obvious when everyone watches at the same time. And that's another downfall with a lot of, uh, or stumbling block, I think, for traditional research in larger companies, is that the researcher does the research, and then they have to write a report, and then they have to like, explain it or pitch it to the rest of the company. But when everyone watches it, it's, it's a different, it's a different uh, story. Another way to think about the research, too, is that we're not necessarily doing a lot of super nuanced testing here. And we're not doing a 200-person you know, ethnographic study over a matter of months. We're testing some, you know, a few core hypotheses, you know, five or six things that we're really testing um, across five people. And so if you see a pattern across four out of five people, it's fairly you know, kind of big building block kind of fundamental problems, not a bunch of little ticky-tacky, small improvement kind of stuff. It is important to make a list, like what, just exactly what Daniel's saying, of, of what the key questions are. And it's a little bit different than like a, a success criteria, I guess. It's like there's, there's hypotheses that we're wondering about. And one of them might be, does the, does the website looking like the cafe make people feel like it's high quality? 
Does a lot of text make people feel like it's high quality? Does, you know, um, are people able to find beans that they're excited about by, by sorting by region? And, you know, things like that. And, and we'll always make sure that the person who's running the interview knows, like, oh, there's these three questions we really are burning for us, or these five. Um, I think that helps, too. Now, having the right people totally matters. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, frequently when you see design breakdown within organizations, it's almost never because, you know, your Photoshop comps aren't good enough. It's usually politics. And it's frequently you know, bad relationships between people within organizations. And so it's really crucial for us to make sure that the real decision makers are in the room. Or else, I mean, we've had a few sprints go sideways when um, we weren't able to get the right people in the room. I think there's a lesson we've kind of learned the hard way. And then we've gone and done a sprint for a week. We came back with a bunch of lessons. And those lessons end up being left on the floor. They, they don't really end up making the product because the, the, you know, the core people weren't there. Um, so a lot of it's like pre-sprint communication. Um, it's explaining kind of what the importance of the sprint is to people, um, talking about like that we want their voice to be heard um, early in the process because you know the, the decision makers are frequently kind of you know a core voice within the organization. Um, and sometimes it's just cajoling people, figuring out, you know, it's soft, basic soft skills of working within an organization, figuring out kind of how to how to, you know, what 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 um, factors to kind of lean on in order to to convince somebody that this is really worth spending a full week of their time. Um, and we've been fairly, I know, and again, that's a hand wavy thing, but um, politics within organizations are frequently a hand wavy thing. Um, and there's not like a, a single bullet that, that gets people in the room. In fact, bullets are a terrible metaphor for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that in, in, yeah, oh, sorry, I was supposed to repeat, repeat the question. So the, the question was, um, with the small amount of time, how do, you, how do you pick which part of what might be a large problem to focus on? And, I think that a, a flippant but, uh, but part of the answer is that the, the short uh, time constraint actually helps with that focus a lot. Because when you know like we only have four days until people come in, there's only so much we can prototype in a day. And especially after you've run a sprint and you get a sense for how much you can do in a day using you know, whatever tricks you, you can, um, that helps you pick how much big the scope because you're like, eh, I just, we can't do that much. And if you bid off more than you can chew, you just won't prototype it all and it won't be in the test on, on Friday. Um, but, uh, but the other part of it is, uh, or the other parts are, we try to talk about it ahead of time. So we try to find out what people want to focus on. And we'll try to narrow it a bit, but I think it's actually easiest to make the decision about what to scope once everybody's in the room and you will make a map on, the, on a whiteboard of who are all the user types who you guys are considering? Who are the people who we might bring in? We try to pick one of those and how do they move through the product? Let's just like really make a really very simple, you know, like this happens, arrow, this happens, arrow, this arrow happens. It doesn't take a, a, a real long time to map that out. And then you try to have that discussion about like which piece of this, which pieces do we, do we focus in on? But you'd um, be surprised, I mean, kind of contrary to what Jake's saying, <laughs> you'd be surprised how broad the scope can be. Yeah, like that true. blue bottle sprint, we just showed you a little piece of it. We were testing what people's first reaction is, kind of coming to a store, kind of what their level of trust is with the, with the coffee maker. We were testing, can they figure out which beans are the right ones for them? And we were also even testing um, ways to do a subscription service, because there are several ways to do a subscription service. Um, we actually kind of compared and contrasted in two of those comps. Um, oh, this coffee company does subscriptions. Oh, I can do it monthly, or I need to commit to an entire year. Um, we're able to test even those things all within um, a week. So fairly ambitious, but they're the big low-hanging fruit um, uh, kind of problems that the company was knew they were facing, I guess. So we almost never choose the, the problems that we're going to tackle. We mostly tease it out of the company themselves. Again, if it's, if it's not important enough for them to do it in a sprint, then you know, they're unlikely to ship it. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's, that's a great question. It's kind of who's involved in the prototyping phase on, on, on the fourth day. Um, it varies. Obviously, you need to move that quickly. You need at least some familiarity with the tool. Um, so sometimes it's just um, you know, a few of us doing it. We really like to be able to involve um, a product manager or um, a designer if there is one on the, the other team. Um, 
the more people the better, not just to have more hands, but also to um, have them learning by doing um, can, be, can be really, really helpful. So that's, again, you know, Keynote's a lot more approachable than Photoshop, but I'm still not expecting somebody who's not at all familiar with Keynote to jump in and, and be pounding away. Um, but we also can task them with other things that aren't necessarily um, working on the computer. We have people, okay, I'm gonna need copy on this page. It's not all the way thought through yet. Um, sketch it out on a whiteboard and I'll copy it into the doc or you know, work in Notepad and just send it to me. Um, lots of stuff like that. I, I'm not sure if we've emphasized this enough, but the writing in these things is unbelievably important. I, I more than ever value copywriting after doing this kind of prototyping. Because um, I can visual design with the best of them and uh, you know, one of the guys we work with, John, is an okay visual designer. He's a really good writer, and he'll fucking destroy me all the time in yeah. these things. You find out when you do these battle royales week after week that, like, you're like, John's just crushing you again and again. And like, yeah. writing really matters much more than, than we ever realized. So tasking, you know, Hopefully, more people can do things like copyright and that kind of thing. So try to disperse it. And we actually find one last thing on that is that uh, having people who are good writers as a part of your team that you bring in is really helpful. Having marketers, people you, you know, might not think of it at first blush as being part of the design and engineering team uh, will help a lot. <laughs> the, Depends who, you, who we have. Yeah. The, so two-part question. For, let's see if, uh, first part is, how do we structure the, uh, the interviews with the users? And the second part is how do we bribe them to, to show up uh, in the first place? So for the first part, we, um, it does vary depending on, uh, uh, on, the, on the, the project and you know, how far along the, the, um, the product is that we're working on. We'll sometimes, you know, we're not a, a, you know, completely opposed to doing like an A-B test on something, but generally speaking, we do user interviews. And, the, um, Michael Margolis, he's the, the research partner on our team, will write an interview script and, and he'll, this is actually kind of a nice trick, he won't participate in the sprint with us all the time, but we'll check in with him at, on, on Monday when we decide who are the kinds of people that we want to bring in, and then like on Wednesday we'll say, here's what we got so far, does it make sense to you? Uh, or sorry, not Wednesday, but on Thursday, like midday Thursday, we're prototyping, and he'll be like, whoa, what about, you know, he'll, he'll ask us a lot of tough questions because he hasn't got Stockholm Syndrome from being in the room all week. And, um, and so th that, that helps quite a bit. But the, the interviews are basically, you know, a little bit of a warm-up, uh, asking the person about, you know, what they do, you know, how do they buy coffee and how do they do things today, and then, um, and then sort of walking them through the prototype and mostly observing them and uh, Michael, I think, is an expert at the, uh, the sort of the pregnant pause. You know, he'll say, he'll say things like, someone will be, they'll be talking, he'll say, oh, oh. and if you just like freeze like that for long enough, people will keep talking and, and tell you more. Um, yeah, in terms of recruiting people, um, it really depends on who, who we're looking for. So as I was saying, we've done tests with oncologists and investors and um, you know, a lot of common folk. Um, so we use Craigslist frequently. Um, and the pitch is basically, you know, you'll get a hundred bucks. Is a hundred bucks usually? Seventy-five or a hundred. Um, usually an Amazon gift card. Um, so we do, you know, pay a reasonable market rate for somebody to come in and do research. Um, and we do a screener. Um, so, you know, we don't just say on Craigslist, like, who wants a hundred bucks? Um, <laughs> that doesn't work very good um, or very well. And it works very well, well but not, <laughs> it's not effective. <laughs> um, so what, what happens is they actually click through and go to um, uh, like a, a survey that they fill out. We kind of bury the questions in the survey that are the kind of the crucial ones for, you know, we don't, the first question isn't, do you love coffee? You know, um, that's kind of like in a set of questions about kind of food, that kind of thing. Um, and, but when we're recruiting, say, founders to come in to, you know, see the, the new, you know, Google Ventures site that we're working on, um, we obviously aren't looking on Craigslist very much, and we're using um, a lot of social connections to, to figure that out. People who are kind of third level friends of people we know. So they're not terribly familiar with us, and they're not friends with us, mm -hmm. but they're, um, you know, obviously fit our criteria. And even they like $100 gift cards. Kind of like on top of that, how do you... Um, so how do we convince kind of the big wigs to show up for, for user studies? Um, we're obviously not gonna bar them into the room and, and not let them leave. And, but they frequently are there because we've convinced them in the day one 
you know, when they were there to help us with the research of the value of actually watching some of their customers actually use their product. And you'd be surprised how infrequently a lot of people see that stuff. And then, you know, you give them the opportunity that just grab a coffee, sit down, you know, let's watch these together. Um, it's actually not that hard to convince them. Um, we do record them, obviously, so you can watch them afterwards, you know, if someone's not able to attend. But um, again, it's like that question I was answering a second ago. It's some of this is soft politics. And uh, it's just a matter of um, kind of finding the right ways to convince the right people. It's also not always crucial that the, the decider, if their time is limited, be in the sprint all day, every day, five days. You know, um, if, if they're, sometimes we'll just decide like what are the right checkpoints. And just like we have checkpoints with Michael who's outside of the room, it might be that that's the best way to involve a, a founder or whoever the decider is. Uh, but it's important to have them. What's, what doesn't work is when they're, when they're not involved and when they don't see the progression throughout the week. So, um, so it's not like a non-starter if you can't get that person for 40 hours. Yeah, we, we have tried that. And um, we've actually been talking recently about you know, trying to do some more experiments uh, around the, the, the timing of it. Um, part of the reason why we stick to five days or stick to what you can do in before a weekend, basically, because sometimes we'll do three and sometimes we'll do four days, is um, it's probably because it's, it's easier mentally to kind of think like, okay, I'm going to do this unusual thing for my company, but it's just for a week. Like, it's kind of easier to think of committing to a week than committing to two weeks. Uh, it also helps to have a sort of continuity that people are, are just, you know, like in this room, we've got the stuff up on the walls, we just do this every day, and you don't have time to get distracted away. It kind of stays in, in your mental RAM. And um, I also think that a week turns out to be it's kind of some, some nice coincidences about the amount of work you can accomplish in a week, the amount of prototyping you can do in a day, and how much you can show people in like an hour uh, interview, and, and how much you can digest. And it turns out that like a week is about right for all, all those things. Yeah. Something we do frequently though, is that we'll do multiple sprints in a row, and the first sprint will involve more people, you know, including ourselves, and the entire week, and then in the follow-on week, um, there'll be, instead of like two or three of us involved with them, maybe one of us will be there to help them, you know, kind of remember how the process works. And instead of one of us doing the user study, one of them might do the user study because they've seen how those are done now. And, uh, you know, our whole goal as a design team is not to do design necessarily with our portfolio companies. There's 200 companies and only five of us. It's to teach them how to, how to do great design. And so I think, that process, you know, not only helps us scale, but also helps kind of wean um, them off of our team for running the sprint and helps them kind of keep doing this on a repetitive process uh, over the next year, two years, three years um, to be more successful. And it helps us fix the things that we inevitably get a lot of things wrong the first sprint. And, yeah. and, and so then you're just modifying the, the prototype uh, in sprints like two and three. Shift yeah. to Yeah, so two part question just to repeat for, uh, for the viewers in the, in the ether. Um, the, the first part of the question is, uh, when do we ship the stuff? Does it happen right after the sprint? And, uh, and I think the, the second part is um, it's more about like, how does this kind of fit in with ship early, ship off, and what, how do you, you know, why would you rush to ship? Um, and uh, I can talk about the first one. I, I think that uh, we, I don't want to give the impression that we launched this like right afterwards, actually. And I also don't want to give the impression that we think you should be sprinting all the time. Sprinting is a really good way to make fast progress on a big problem. Doing something new for the first time, doing a new feature, or, or redesigning a significant part of a, of a product. Um, but it's, it would be exhausting to do this all the time, uh, you know, 52 weeks a year. So we usually will do sprints, and you can think about it as like we're trying to steer like a really big boat. And then once we feel pretty good about the direction we're headed, then, you know, it's okay for them to do things the way they usually do things, to, f to go through all the use cases, as you said, or you know, figure out all of the, the details. There's just a lot of details left unexplored in, in a prototype like this, and we know that going in. We won't answer all the questions. Um, but something that's new, would you like ship it after like, how many sprints, how many use cases? You know? Well, I mean, it really depends on, on the product. And, and, uh, but in, in almost every case, you know, there's the rare case where we would do a sprint and find that something like, oh my gosh, that's such an exciting idea and it worked so well. 
we want to try to, they want to actually build it for real. But understand that like what we're showing here, it's not real. Like it's totally, it's, it's useful as an idea, but it's not something that they can go and, and implement, you know, the keynote mock-up. So they've, they've still got to build something. Sometimes they might get really excited and like write something up in code really quick and, and you know, launch a, a you know, fake door or something to get some more real data. But uh, there's always going to have to be a, a you know, a, a step, a process where you actually make the thing real, do the real design work, do the nitty gritty, and that stuff's really important. And I don't think that doing that stuff fast and, and you know, trying to ship that as soon as you can once you're confident, that's still a good thing. It's just nice to have that confidence first because it is, it is costly. Sure, so, so how do we adapt this process for, for different environments? Um, so first of all, we kind of choose the tools that, that are appropriate, so obviously, you know, if you're building a mobile phone app, we may not use Keynote. It's not very good on a, on a mobile phone. We, uh, I use an app a lot called Flinto that's um, really good for stitching together a fairly high fidelity prototypes. Um, so choosing the right tools, and then the, depending on the tools, we can also do things like get into context. So um, we work with Sidecar, for instance, who's um, a ride sharing service, and we've done some studies with them that actually involve getting in cars with people and you know using a mobile interface while you're bouncing down a San Francisco road is obviously a lot different than sitting inside an office um, and so that's you know very successful um, we're getting waved at sure. all right <laughs> um, so as far as this is a process it's also not like a prison that we get locked into we're really flexible in terms of particularly in terms of recruiting the right types of people in terms of how we run the user study so it's not always in an office. It's not, you know, we actually did a study recently. That's public, right? I don't know what the, you're going to say. I thought you could read my mind. Yes. The, the <laughs> trucking one? Uh, I don't know. Oh, OK. Maybe. I mentioned we work with not. truckers. You can imagine that that study was not, you know, in a corporate office. Um, yeah. So we're actually, um, you know, getting, we often get out in the field and, and do tests like that. So. And in terms of like, uh, you know, building like physical objects versus um, stuff like, like software, uh, it's, uh, to be frank, we don't work with a lot of companies that are doing physical objects. <laughs> but I do think that if you have the notion of like, we're gonna try to build and test something in a week, now what? Like the people are coming in like, oh my God, now what? How do we, how do, we do it and how do we try to make it real? That you get awfully creative. And uh, I, was, I was actually recently talking to this, like just out of interest to a, a Fortune 500 company that makes these like industrial pumps. And they like heard about the sprint process and they were like, we're interested in trying this, but you know, how can we do it? Because we've got to make like a pump that somebody can use on an assembly line. And I was like, well, you can't. I don't know how you're going to prototype that in a week. But and they were like, well, no, don't you know? We've got these 3D printers, and we, you know, and, and they were and like, I was like, oh, like may, maybe there is a way. Um, which is basically a long, rambling way of saying that I, I think that if you if you have pressure and you're motivated and you know you know your domain, you probably could think of something that's that's a fast way to fake it yeah. that um, that doesn't involve the full production. So, yeah. All right, you guys are awesome. Everybody, give it up for Jason.